Exactly. I'd like to call the first school committee meeting of the year uh, to order. And uh, our first issue is to have the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. So, uh, did uh, everybody have a chance to look at the minutes from our meeting of uh, June 26th? Mm -hmm. Yes. And we're all set. Any comments or amendments or anything? Okay. Uh, could I have a motion to approve the minutes of June 26th, 2019, please? So Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Great. Uh, now I'd like to open it up for public comment, if there is any public comment at the beginning of the meeting. Okay. No Good. pressure. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay. Um, so now we have a series of reports for the school committee. So Dr. Klingeman, would you like to start with that, please? Thank you. It's good to see everyone. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to report on some of the things that have been happening throughout the month of August leading into this busy first week of school. So starting back in um, August, our district administrators spent two days together on August 7th and 8th um, to do some planning for the school year. We began with prioritizing um, year one of our strategic plan and we're beginning to develop a district improvement plan that will take some of the goals from our strategic plan and separate them into year one, two, and three. Um, this district improvement plan that we're working on will feed our school individual school improvement plans. The administrative team also participated in a training on how to conduct effective internal in investigations led by Jean Hurdle from Safety and Respect at Work. So that was interesting and helpful. And then next week in August, August 19th, 20th, and 21st, we had a wonderful new teacher induction program. Rita Marie Benoit, our Alden School Curriculum Supervisor, and Jim Donovan, our high school principal, and I led the program, and we welcomed 17 new teachers. We had two Chandler teachers, four Alden, four at Duxbury Middle School, and seven new Duxbury High School teachers. And the teachers um, that are new to the district are here because of retirements or resignations from, from last, last June. So on Day one of the new teacher induction, we also um, held a new mentor and mentor coordinator training for the district mentors, which was led by Mary Merrigan O'Brien from Teachers 21. So our new um, mentor program focus is going to center around social emotional learning. And while the new mentors were being trained, we had our new staff members come in for their technology onboarding session. They got their new ID cards and we filmed a video that was shown at convocation, which when I'm finished, I'd like to share with you this evening that introduces all of our new staff members so you can That's place great. a face to the names. Um, the second day of the new teacher induction, we had a welcome back breakfast with the mentors, new teachers, and our district administrative team. This day focused on a menu of elementary and secondary activities um, that were helping to get the teachers ready for action on day one. So we focus on operations, curriculum, technology, and opening, opening of school um, information. On the third day of the new teacher induction, we had presentations by um, me, I did one, on district expectations and our, um, rolling out our new strategic plan to the new staff as well as familiarizing them with the um, tech, the, excuse me, the um, evaluation process. And then Melissa Laidlaw, who is our secondary team chair, she led a special education overview for our new staff members. We went on to have a wonderful tour of Duxbury, led by Tony Kelso, who operates our Performing Arts Center and is also the town historian. And then the, the new teachers spent a few hours with their building principals, familiarizing themselves with their new school buildings. And then finally, convocation was last week on Monday. Seems like a long time ago, now that we've had the students back for a week. But um, we welcomed our teaching staff back on Monday. Staff members had building-based meetings to start the day. And they finished the day with an all-district welcome led by Dr. Antonucci and myself. And Julia. And Julia, yes, Julia, <laughs> thank you for speaking at convocation. Um, we then had a cookout, which was sponsored by Chartwell and led by Kelly Prince, our food services director. <coughs> we had some fun music um, that was provided by our HR director, 
Jerry Penizak and his oh, band. So we'd awesome. like to thank Kelly Prince for uh, and her staff for their hard work. But the band was. Great. What do they play? What kind of music? All kinds. You name it. They have a big playlist. They play. They play. Kind of yeah, bars and clubs cake. all over the place. That's yeah. hilarious. Yeah. I got to pick the, uh, a lot of the songs, so I got the playlist ahead of time. It was, <laughs> <laughs> was all my favorite songs that <laughs> Jerry and his band played. And uh, then on Tuesday's Professional Development Day, we had department and building-based meetings in the morning, and we again came together as a district to hear a positive and encouraging message from the speaker, Tom Murray, who's the Director of Innovation from Future Ready Schools, which is a project of the Alliance for Excellent Education in Washington, D.C. And he's a really renowned speaker, so we were happy to have him here in Duxbury. We partnered with Carver and Silver Lake Public Schools in order to bring him to our district, so he did a couple of um, different districts on the South Shore last week, so and we got some good feedback, and it was um, just a really encouraging start for the teachers, and students came back Wednesday, and we saw Dr. Antonucci's message, so we had a lot of smiling faces on the first day, and it's been great so far. <laughs> it sounds like that convocation had a real impact on the teachers from the letters it was unbelievable. you shared. Yeah. That's really, really it's great. Really good. Mm -hmm. good. good couple awesome. of days. Yeah. I know I said this to you in an email, but um, so the vision behind, we made a lot of changes to how we open up school, but credit goes to Danielle. And uh, she sort of had the vision for how, you know, what, what a new uh, format could look like, and it was, it was just a home run. So good job, Danielle. Thank That's you. Awesome. Nice. Yeah. A lot That's of work. Great. Yeah. Many yeah. people. Oh, yeah. Do you guys mind thinking like yeah. that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just, it's literally just a welcome, um, sort of a uh, quick intro to our new staff. This is thanks to Dave Hagen from the technology department. Love Dave. Michelle McKay, Special Ed, Alden School. I'm Diane Dwyer, and I teach Special Education at the Alden School. Hi, my name is Emma Coronella, and I'll be teaching third grade at Alden. Hi, I'm Abigail Hammond. I'll be working at the middle school at the CA School Social Worker. Hi, I'm Max Staffa. I teach Mandarin and French at Duxbury Middle School. Hi, everyone. My name is Ashley Sapphire, and I'll be the sixth grade guidance counselor at Duxbury Middle School. Hi there, my name is Christy Walker. I'll be teaching 8th grade ELA at Duxbury Middle School this year. Hi, I'm Jenna Lee Coyne, and I'm the new assistant principal at Duxbury Middle School. Bonjour, my name is Shay. I'll be teaching French at the high school this year. Hi, I'm Cindy McChuckby. I'm teaching at Duxbury High School, special education. Hi, I'm Christina Sergi, and I'm going to be teaching English at DHS. Ni hao, wo jiao Zhang Lao Shi. Uh, uh, hi everybody, I'm uh, Ms. Zhao. Uh, my first name is Jira, last name is Zhao. Uh, I'm going to be the Duxbury High School Mandarin teacher. Hi, I'm Lauren Bollinger, and I'll be teaching English at the high school. Hi, my name is Brittany Martin. I will be teaching ASL. <laughs> hi, so for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Ashley Morrison, and I've been here for five years, but I just recently <laughs> joined the English Department of Teaching Fresh <laughs> Video, but as you can see, we have a really nice new group of teachers that um, are bringing a lot of positive energy to the mm. school district. So, Great. so there's two Mandarin teachers. Mm -hmm. I believe so. Well, one was doing one, Mandarin and French. Um, yeah. One, one, mm -hmm. So we have. Right? Yep. So French. one of the teachers that was there <laughs> is doing a, some, some uh, Mandarin and some French. Yeah. And then we have the other. And is that just due to the number of students? Or no, we had turnover in that position. Okay. No, but that we haven't, uh, I mean, I got to think about the budget cycles. I think we increased it by 0.2 to right. last year. Okay. To um, 
make sure the kids could track through. Right, okay. Right? But it. the reason there are new bodies is because we had some turn, one turn of the teachers left. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, cool. Gotta remember that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we had a very busy and very productive summer in the business office. So some of the tasks that um, we were busy with were some of the new staff onboarding. So that keeps the human resources department very busy. Um, we're also very busy with the new student registration, um, with also the bus registration, which keeps us very busy. And um, we were successful in closing out fiscal year 19. Great. And then we were also um, very busy opening up fiscal year 20 and then also preparing for fiscal year 21. <laughs> so <laughs> just in summary for fiscal year 19, um, we did end with a balance of $104,745. Um, and I'll provide a detailed year-end report at the next school committee meeting, but just to give you an idea of what the balance is, um, the surplus that will go back into the special ed reserve fund at um, next town meeting. Um, we'll also be discussing fiscal year 20 budget tonight, um, and I'll be providing some additional information on the increases in some of our out-of-district tuition expenses as well as some of the salary recasts that we've done with some of the staff turnover. And for fiscal year 21, the administrative team is in the process of working on their capital um, budget request for fiscal year 21. And next week, we'll be rolling out the operating budget template so that they can start working on the operating budget request for fiscal year 21. Um, and also at the next meeting, I will be sharing our district budget calendar for fiscal year 21. So just to give everyone an idea of kind of the timing uh, and how we see that going throughout the year. comments. Uh, I think you've all seen our calendar of uh, meeting uh, uh, meetings for the coming year and with a few agenda items entered in. Uh, it's a work in progress. Yeah, I'm not, yeah, as, I, as, you, as I'm looking at that, Julie, I'm not sure if the, the, the filled out one is in there. Full. I'll make sure. Did you send, you, I think I gave it to just you. To me. You okay. Yeah. Yeah, right. I'll, okay. I'll Sorry about that. To, I'll send that out tomorrow. So we have this, um, and it's a work in progress. So if you have items that you would like to see on it, or um, issues that you'd like to have addressed, either um, send a request to John or through me or however you want to do it. Um, but it, it's flexible okay. and um, up for um, up for discussion at at any point in the year. So um, so please keep that in mind. Can, uh, we, can I just throw out like a yes. Chromebook review at some point, sure. like we did yes. when we first put on the, whenever right. you think it's yeah. mid-year? Yeah. yeah. You know, there's always that back to school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's um, that would be good. And uh, then, uh, as Dr. Klingerman said, I uh, I attended convocation, which was great, and the speaker the next day, which was very inspirational and. Um, and fun. Uh, also during the summer I attended a mental health first aid um, workshop which was provided by the Plymouth County Suicide Prevention Task Force or Coalition uh, and it was a, a professional development session that they had held here in Duxbury um, in April that I hadn't been able to go to uh, and some of our teachers attended I believe. Um, but I went uh, to a session during the summer. It was really useful and um, and free. So I would recommend that for any of you who are interested in um, mental health issues uh, around adults or students. Um, they have their sessions are focused depending on who their audience is. 
Um, the session I attended was for primarily for adults, but um, they do various age groups for students as well. And who does that? It's the Plymouth County Suicide Prevention Coalition. Okay. Um, and I have their contact details if you're okay. interested. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, yeah, very interesting mm -hmm. um, group of people. Uh, I also attended um, earlier in the summer uh, Duxbury Facts a Community Summit, uh, and we they were interested to know what types of issues they should focus their programming on this year within the community. So having spoken with John, I suggested that they look into vaping as an issue that where um, both students and parents needed a lot of information. And uh, more recently, as you've seen in the news, there are some pretty serious problems, health problems arising from vaping. So. Um, I'm hoping that we'll be hearing from them in due course about some programming uh, in that area. Uh, I also um, had a conversation with the Envision, Envision Duxbury planning team around their ideas for growth, and we can talk about it more when we talk about the budget. But generally, their outlook for growth, um, new growth as a proportion of municipal revenue, in Duxbury is very limited over the next 20 years of the Envision plan. Uh, and so that supports um, what our, our town finance director, his, his forecasts uh, in the near term are for very limited new growth contributing to revenue uh, for the town. Uh, they also mentioned that um, the expansion of affordable housing is, is a priority. Uh, which, of course, may or may not have implications for the schools. Um, so in the news this week are, are two projects in, on Temple Street and mm -hmm. north side of Duxbury, um, where the proposal is for what, 250 housing units, um, mm -hmm. which could be kind of have serious implications. On all departments. On all departments. School. Yes. Um, and certainly the reports following the development in Island Creek um, in uh, near exit 10, mm -hmm. you know, the, the burden on the public safety yeah. uh, and other departments was, was elevated as a result of that. So it's something to look out for as we think about our, the school district and where we might go. We need to keep an eye on, on what the planning department and the, the various committees in town are doing. Um, and I think that's everything from me. So, to, to any of you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I only went like on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you about a lot of other things <laughs> that I won't. Um, so, uh, yes, any, anybody else have things that they want to raise? Okay over to you. Yeah, just a couple of things. Um, the first, and this is sort of like just-in-time information, um, but just so the committee knows, tonight, um, uh, Boston 25, I guess, the news station, formerly Fox, is running a story on um, carbon monoxide detect monoxide, or carbon monoxide detectors in schools. I'm not sure what their angle is. I can sure it'll be salacious. Um, <laughs> so just so you know, and if people ask, and we'll do some outreach probably on social media, but we have carbon monoxide detectors in all of our schools. Um, and so <coughs> in case there's panic in the streets um, mm -hmm. from this news story. So we are, we are fortunate to have them. Uh, I've talked to the fire department about uh, 5 o'clock tonight, and Great. we're all good. Great. Okay. So we responded to a kind of public records request about a month ago about whether or not we had them. Uh, I don't know. Who knows where the story's coming from, but just, just so you know. Um, okay. Um, second, a real quick piece of information is um, it's an invitation uh, and, and notification, but the Commissioner of um, Department of uh, Elementary and Secondary Education, uh, Jeff Riley, is visiting Duxbury on October 8th. He's sort of, he's been the commissioner, this is his second year, and he was supposed to come out early last year, and there was a conflict, and so he kind of rescheduled, rescheduled, and now it's going to be October 8th. He's coming here for just a short amount of time. He'll be here from 9.40 to 10.45. I'll send this out by, in writing. Um, really just, he wants to meet with a group of students and staff uh, and um, 
really any, anybody, but he'll do a presentation. The details, we're working out the details right now about the, the, the where and um, what location, but um, you're, you're all invited. I hope, I hope you, you choose to attend. So October 8th, um, 940 to 1045. So that's that. Um, and then really the final piece, I, I, I've done this done this at the beginning of the year, the last couple of years, just really a, a FYI on enrollment. So school enrollment is really official on October 1st. It's just the way the state tracks it, but I'm just giving you, oh, this does, it's funny, this doesn't work, the clicker doesn't work um, on the TV for some reason, but I'm giving you opening day enrollment in the, the third column over, and I'm comparing it to June's enrollment. Right, and just, just to say what happened since the end of last year. Uh, and as you can see here, Chandler School is down by seven kids, Alden down by 22, right, right on down. And I, I just kind of want to point out, because there's always questions about enrollment and, and declining enrollment and what potential impact that might have on staffing. I thought this was an interesting uh, how, this, how this shook out this year. So if you look at the middle school, that's 10 kids, right? over three grades, over multiple subject areas spread across seven periods a day, right? So you don't, the drop, it's negligible, right? It's, a, it's very much a, a nominal increase or, or decrease. Same thing goes for high school, right? Out of almost 1,000 kids, you have a slight, slight decrease. So there's no opportunity really for um, efficiencies or staff reduction when you consider how spread out those kids are over, over the, the day. However, if you look at Alden, so we had projected this pretty well last year. And because our fifth grade class that was graduate, I use the term graduate, because the fifth grade class was graduating from Alden was much higher than the third grade class that was incoming, we knew that we had some chance for some economies. And so if you recall in last year's budget, we reduced a, a classroom teacher, mm -hmm. right? So 22 kids, depends where they are over three grades, but 22 kids, that, that, that could have an impact, that couldn't have an impact at the middle school or high school. So I just, so I just wanted to kind of show you, I'm gonna actually stand up, but I'm gonna show you the difference. So this is just a breakout, you have this in your class, this is just class by class, the actual class count. Um, right now we have 10 classes at Alden, Last year, we had 11, right? So the reason I want to show you this is to say, A, we did what we said we were going to do, right, in the budget. But as enrollment is declining over the next year, two years, three years, four years, five years, we're never going to see a big, sort of a big drop in any one year. What you do when enrollment starts declining is you, you take it incrementally. And it and it's sort of and unfortunately it kind of gets absorbed instantly. So that 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 cut is gone. We took it in one year. It had some uh, provided some relief for us in the FY20 budget cycle, but we can't take that cut again, right? So as as it goes down, so I there's a lot of there's a, we get a lot of questions about this about oh as enrollments drop, you're just going to one year you know have a big drop. We're never going to have that. So I just I thought this was a great example just to show this is actually how it happens. I'd say this too, it has implications, right? So had we kept that teacher, we might have we might have put that in grade four, mm -hmm. right? And, it, and we put that in grade four, our class sizes might be a little, a little smaller, right? It would have gone to about 19 and a half instead of 21 and a half on average. So I always, I always like to remind people when you make a budget decision, it actually has implications and we can see it. We can see it actually class by class. We're in great shape. I don't want to imply any, anything else, but I did want to show how kind of our projection um, came to fruition and how our budget decision, how it actually shakes out. Mm -hmm. Real kids, real teachers, real, uh, real class sizes. So uh, I just wanted to show you that. I really, I personally really appreciate that follow up to kind of pull it full circle so people can understand the impact and see the numbers. And I, I mean, I think we are in good shape, but I do mm -hmm. think, I mean, I'm actually a little bit surprised by the numbers in fourth and third grade. You know, we've got a lot of 22s and 23s up there. And that's not fantastic. It's not bad. But it's kind of 
on the upper end of I think where we all want to be yeah. for that for that age. Yeah. Yeah. So you certainly um, you wouldn't you wouldn't want to be in the mid twenties, right? And right. Then, so you kind of right. you get perilous, yeah. perilously close to. So we had we had right. um, over third, the summer. I understand third grade yeah. had quite a number of a large influx compared to the other grades. I think. So yeah. So what I was going to say is we, right. over the summer we had 114. That's what my kids told me. Registration. Like, we have hundreds of new kids. Now we also, <laughs> but we don't though, right? So right. we also we also Where are they? we also yeah. graduated yeah. a large class, yeah. and we brought a smaller class yeah. in. So. There's always so they're reflected in those numbers. Yeah, they're reflected, yeah. right? Yeah. So, but but if you know, 114 if, had had they all ended up in fourth, right? Right. Uh, 20 of them ended up in fourth grade. Well, by the way, it's not all the realm of possibility, yeah. right? Because people but tend to move to. We're close. They move. Right. Yeah. We're close. Yeah. So anyway, I just Especially wanted to say like third grade, yeah. Yeah. still doing the reading thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's just really interesting to see that, and I think to yeah. see it every year is nice. Yeah. 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 And we'll keep we'll keep this up. We actually this this particular spreadsheet which you have, we keep that. Current all year, yeah. um, just because we're good. constantly we constantly have fluctuations, we're constantly tracking it, um, and um, yeah. And the one other thing I'll add about enrollment is um, at, at, uh, I don't have the detail. I'll send you the detail over the next few days, probably. But at the middle school, you know, we kind of had this hot like a hot spot last year and the year before with the math. That's mitigated, it's not perfect, but if you remember, we made a huge curriculum change in the middle of last year. We took away that second math. Remember right. Brandon Jocelyn and Danielle did a big presentation. That was at the same time the budget was being developed. We knew this was gonna have positive implications to class size. We just have, hadn't really fully had that flushed out. So good news is that we're out of the 30s and we don't have any 31s or 32s. So the highest um, math class right now in grade seven is 27. We do have two classes at 27, but I take that as good news. So it's a you know, step in the right direction. Um, we still have a bubble you know, in grade seven, um, but we, we have it's just 30. I know it's a, small, it's a small number, but there's a big difference between 31 and 32 and, and, and 27. We want it to be lower. Right. Um, but so we did, we were able to mitigate that a little bit, and that was really driven by the curricular changes we made um, and kind of shuffling the deck a little bit on, on classes. So. I'm just curious, why is there a, um, a disparity in the, like for like in grade three or grade four? There's like a few 19s, but then there's some 23s when the average is like 21. And yeah, so without having all the details about the placement, it would it would just have to do with like the profile of the class. The class, okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. So that's it, yeah. Any questions, please, you know, please let me know, but I just wanted to get you, get you up to speed as of day one. Okay. Thank you. Great. Any other, do you want to move on to the literacy plan? Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. this is a little sure. Sure. has a three-year um, technology plan. So last year we embarked on um, developing our next three-year digital literacy plan. So the process was we formed the DPS Digital Literacy Committee in September of 2018. And every year we do have a DPS technology committee and so we took the current members, asked them, and then we rounded it out. We had um, administrators, school committee, teachers, um, parents, and students on the committee. We met monthly, and Danielle and I were co-chairs with a focus on both district-level discussions and school-level discussions. 
um, and we use the updated mass digital literacy computer science standards as a guide for the process. Meantime, there were a number of us on the committee that were also working on the strategic plan. So Danielle and I made sure that we closely followed the strategic plan process to ensure the compatibility of the new DPS technology plan with the DPS strategic goals and pillars. So it's broken up into five parts. First of all, it's we have the new DPS mission, vision, core values, and four pillars at the front of the digital literacy plan. Then we had the DPS technology vision that the committee worked on, followed by the DPS tech plan goal alignment with the DPS strategic goals. So all year long, we were building kind of what our action plans are to were and what our, our high priority items were. So in the spring, we were able to take those and then um, align them with the DPS strategic goals or pillars. Um, and then we have the school, each of the schools did their own Massachusetts digital literacy literacy computer science standards action plans what were the next steps we looked at them over the last year and they started to figure out what they were going to do with them but now they've made an action plan as part of the technology plan to move forward to implementing those dlcs standards and then finally um, we have the dps technology department's annual action plan and that's really what the tech plan has always been Every year we have a, an action plan and it was developed from the state's technology plan 10 or 15 years ago on all the different sectors of what a technology department should be doing and we use those as an action plan each year and you'll see that's where we highlight some of the high pri priority needs in those. So then we took the, so the four pillars each has kind of a goal statement about what the technology department is doing um, to meet the needs of the strategic plan. And then there are action items under each one of those pillars that you can see in the technology plan. So the first one is pillar one, the DPS technology department will utilize technology and data resources to provide a safe and secure academic and social environment for students and staff and is committed to treating all members of the school community with respect and dignity. So action items under there all in, focus on um, safety and security, we, get, we had a at the end of last year, um, John, Danielle, and I um, got a $60,000 safety grant, so that will kind of be part of it. Um, pillar two is um, the Duxbury Technology Department recognizes the individual needs of students and strives to ensure that all students graduate having reached their maximum potential. So all of the things that we're doing to support students in the classroom, with technology and technology resources and any special adaptive things that they need. Pillar three is the Duxbury Technology Department will support the self-study of the district's current programs and structures with a view to expanding opportunities for our 21st century students. And we are very excited to be working on that as we expand the programs and, and structures to include more, um, more things that will benefit our students. Computer science, programming, some additional offerings. Right. So there are some specialty areas that we can help a lot with. Mm -hmm. Pillar four, the technology department is committed to providing global learning opportunities that will allow students to develop an understanding of the world and global issues, a mindset that embraces diversity and multiple perspectives, and an ability to take action on issues of global and local significance. Our technology allows us to open the windows 
students to the, to the window to the world and, and being able to talk with people all over the world and have experiences. Um, high priority needs that we continue to advocate for includes um, instructional technology coaches to improve teaching and learning in the classroom, being able to have someone work with teachers to move them along the continuum um, and helping them develop curriculum. A move towards to one-to-one -to -one student devices at Alden to accommodate curricula needs and MCAS needs. Um, uh, the devices at Alden are seven or eight years old. The MCAS um, needs, they have set standards and our operating systems in Alden, we got a, um, we got a pass and they allowed us to use the old operating system. So that's something that we're already working on um, to bring devices to students that can handle the MCAS test. And then we also still need to develop a sustainable plan to replace Chandler student devices as they fail. fail. They have iPads and um, desktops at Alden, um, and we've already started working on a plan to um, move more devices into Chandler as well. So for one-to-one, -one, is that just for MCAS, not for day-to-day -day learning? Um, I think so the hope is to be able to have students have access to computers the as they need them on a card on, on a one to one basis as they as they need them what they are we're hearing from Alden teachers they have curriculum that is partially based as as a piece of software as a as a package and most textbooks are coming that way now um, you can do a lot with um, they have they have stories and, and video, it, it, it enhances the textbook. And they can, they can- It's interactive. Interactive, and they can tailor the curriculum for each child's needs. So there's a lot that, there are a lot of benefits to that. So Alden does have quite a bit of curricula that's computer-based. Yep. And so from the end of March through May, they're testing for the MCAS. So those devices are used all morning long and other teachers don't have access to them because they're not one-to-one. -one. And those teachers also need the, those devices in order to get through some of their curriculum. We don't want MCAS to interrupt the daily curriculum and our goal is never to have our younger students on the devices more, but what we find is because they're sharing devices at times, they aren't able to access them when it's convenient and we want them to be able to access them when it makes sense in their day to be able to be using the um, computers for science and like Cheryl said, that if they're doing MCAS testing, that really puts a halt on a lot of the curriculum programs and assessment that we do do online, so okay. we're looking to increase them for that reason. Thank you. And our next steps um, to, to continue the work with the Digital Literacy Committee, remember that committee meets every year. So one thing that we need to do as a district, um, and they're also talking, the IT steering committee for the town is also saying we need a policy at the town level too, is to develop a so social media policy for our teachers and students. And then we also have to think about reviewing and potentially making recommend recommendations about ways to archive social media because social media is a public record if they are, are using social media for the district. And so that's something we need to think about. Um, and we also need to continue the work that we started over the last year or two on digital literacy computer science standards and getting those implemented K to 12. And you'll see in the plan, each of the schools explain how they are, their action steps to implement digital lit literacy and computer science standards. And the standards are split up into grade spans. So there's DLCS standards for students in grades K through two, three through five, six through eight, and then nine through 12. And they're pretty um, intense standards that we are even asking our youngest students to um, implement. And so what we're doing now is just working with the teachers um, without the digital 
literacy coaches or instructional technology coaches to find ways to integrate that into the curriculum um, so that students are doing it with, within the curriculum areas that they're already working on. So it's a work in progress. I have one more question. Sure. Um, under Pillar 3, you mentioned trying to expand like computer science classes, which we've talked about for a mm -hmm. while, because Duxbury kids don't have them. Right. With mm -hmm. the budgetary constraints, what are the, I mean, can we trade out classes, or is yeah, it an I evolution think that the, of curriculum? Or? I think that we always have to look at ways that um, have no budget impact to be able to continue to advance program offerings. So I think we'll certainly be looking at the program of studies at the high school to see what our enrollment is in certain courses to see if we have any flexibility to make some of those adjustments without adding additional staff members. Okay. But certainly we want to add computer science and programming opportunities. Right now we have computer science, but it's offered as a um, online course and that's something that we'd really like to have taught by an instructor um, so that yes. it's not just a self-directed online course offering for our students it's a gap yeah it's yes. a huge gap yeah it's a gap it's it's on our it's obviously a priority right mm -hmm. yeah okay thanks thank you it, in the um in your action plan you talk about uh crafting an annual technology budget how far along is that, that's something that you've all, always been doing? That's something that I've always done. So right. I, I do an annual budget. Right. I also have a six to seven year um, budget that I'm looking ahead. Right. Okay. So uh, everyone, and you've probably all seen it over the years, and it's a list of things that either needs to be replaced right. or updated and we cross out every year. I was just working on it this morning, crossing out sure. what I got with um, I kind of saved my money at the end of the year I got to cross out a whole bunch of stuff on my list that didn't get funded last year so <laughs> um, so I did do that right okay yeah great great because as I was reading through this I was putting dollar signs next to everything that had a <laughs> financial <laughs> implication and I thought there are an awful lot of dollar signs in here mm -hmm. and I know that you've had this kind of spending right. plan right rolling over every year yes um, if you see I mean your dollar signs it could be that it's uh, it's still part of our existing of course. budget and right, obviously right. some things that might be involved of course. Yeah. Right. of course I think we're gonna try to focus on having a really comprehensive five-year capital plan Great. too so hopefully we can take some of those um, priorities looking into the future yeah. and incorporate that into the five-year plan great great right yeah and we've it's done complicated quite a bit of saving too right. as well through the tech, the VoIP phone system, we saved quite a bit of money when we moved to that. Um, the the Chromebooks, things like that. So we're always yeah. looking for ways to save. Great. And I, under, well, on page 15, under goal number four, you talk about maintaining a list of up-to-date places where students can access the internet after hours if they yes. don't have access at home? We maintain that on the website. Great. Okay. okay. Anybody else have a question? No? That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Reminded me, I, I totally forgot in my um, superintendent's report. Katie, okay, you'll have to support me on this, but um, not to point to her. I don't mean to point to Shannon, but Shannon God came and asked a question uh, at the June meeting about collecting um, fees or fines, I guess, from students um, for damaged uh, computers at the end of the year. And I just, be, because that was in June, I just wanted to give you a quick update right. and some context on that because it's a, it's a fair question to ask. Um, but just the, we, we ended up collecting fees um, from about 50 students out of about 17 or 1800. So to give it some context, um, and we collected a total of about $5,000 in fines. Um, 
and most of them were for, uh, you know, uh, machines that were significantly damaged. So we didn't really have any um, any issues or any questions, um, uh, you know, beyond beyond uh, here. And so I just wanted to give you a quick update on that. Okay. Um, so, Great. So anyway, I just wanted to say that. And then. Um the machines that are being disposed of, will that, will we, school committee be asked to sign off on yeah, that at we're gonna, some point? Yeah, we're gonna have, I couldn't squeeze it into this yeah. meeting, so probably next meeting we're gonna ask you to uh, surplus, right. because of the state procurement laws, we have to uh, classify things as surplus, and exactly. then, then to dis either dispose of them or sell them, and we're working with the town on that, so probably okay. next meeting. Okay, yeah. great. Thanks. We're just, we're just sort of catching our breath from, from the summer. Okay. And so kind of we're into phase two now of redeploying and, and disposal. Right. So Great. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention no, that. That's really don't trouble. worry. Great. Okay. Um, Blake, would you like to talk about vocational sure. yes. education? So um, just shortly after the April 1st deadline, um, Last year, we had brought to your attention that we had a large number of students that had applied and been accepted to vocational um, education programs, primarily at South Shore Vocational um, High School. So tonight, I just wanted to give you an update on um, how that will be impacting the budget for this year, and then also give you some um, more information on how we're going to cover that gap that we're seeing in the budget. So, um, so the the first slide that I have. Um, so the information on here is just giving you more background on what we had put in the original fiscal year twenty budget. So for tuition, um, we had budgeted for one student going to Norfolk County, and we had seven students going to South Shore Votech. We also included a special education increment, so when the students, if they're on an um, indiv individualized education plan, there is an additional charge when they're attending the vocational program, so we included that as well. So our original budget for fiscal year 20, just for tuition, um, we had said was going to be $147,000. And that was based on our current enrollment, a historical average, and then it did leave us a few openings for new students that we were saying were going to be our rising eighth graders going into ninth grade. For transportation, we had, it was this, a very similar process. We had said, what have we paid in the past? Um, and what do we project that we'll be paying in the future for these students? So uh, for Norfolk County, it's uh, $7,400, and that's a combination of um, yellow bus and van transportation um, because we have to transport the students to Walpole. And then for South Shore Vocational, um, we do contract, and the students are transported in a van, and at the time, we were paying our per student per day charge to transport them to South Shore Votech. So that was the budget the um, budget implication that we had for fiscal year 20, so that $56,000. And so what I put at the bottom as a note was if we take the tuition and the transportation and we just say that the average cost per student, we were, um, the so just the average was going to be $29,000. So we have, I think in some of our conversation, we've kind of said it's on average, it costs us $30,000 to be sending the students out of um, district to, to a vocational school. So summarizing the changes to the vocational budget since town meeting, so with our tuition. So tuition is difficult because we can't make any changes to it. Um, it's not something that we can negotiate, nor do we have any offsets that we can apply against the tuition costs. So the tuition rates that I have provided up here, this is just based off of some of the conversation that we've had with these schools, but they're not finalized yet. So it could still fluctuate. Um, and I had just checked as recent as 
two days ago to see if they have the final rate, and it's um, not finalized yet. So for Norfolk County, we're seeing still close to $24,000 with that one student. And then for South Shore Vocational Technical High School, we do have 17 students that we're confirmed that will be attending South Shore Votech this year. Um, so the total cost is the $289,544. And then we are saying that they'll, there should be three students that have a special education increment cost, um, which is gonna be an additional $6,000. So our total vocational tuition right now, just based off of that estimated tuition costs um, for the students that we know are going to be attending those schools is the $319,000, 319,763. So, of course, we have a pretty significant um, deficit of $172,000. So for transportation, very similar. Um, we have one student going to Norfolk County and um, that transportation cost actually decreased because the student is only requiring partial transportation, so it's not gonna be the full $74,000 that uh, we had originally budgeted for. And then for Social Votech, mm -hmm. we actually um, had worked with our, the contractor that we have our transportation with to switch to a per van charge, so we're being charged per van per day to transport the students to the school, which actually will um, be a significant savings for us. So if we had stayed with the per student per day model, it would have been in excess of $100,000 for the transportation. Um, but switching to that per van per day, it's gonna keep our costs, while we're still running a deficit, it's not gonna be as large of a deficit um, with that, that adjustment. And so the other point that I wanna make um, with that is that we also still have some capacity in the vans so that if we do have any other students, we will see an increase in the tuition costs, but we shouldn't see any increase in that transportation cost because there's still capacity in the vans. So they, they pile 17, how many vans? So we have two vans. Two vans. And then we, have, we do have some students that are um, that will transport themselves. Okay. So we don't have to, so I think right now we probably have three spots that are open, open. for our transportation. Mm -hmm. If they transport themselves, are we paying there or not? Mm -mm. So the deficit with the uh, transportation is the $7,400. So the overall deficit um, from what we had originally budgeted for fiscal year 22, our known um, obligations is $180,000. But again, as a note, the average cost per student is lower at the $21,287, and that's because of the efficiency in switching to the um, per van yeah. expense. So why the increase? Um, we don't have any firm answers for that, but I think some of the contributing factors um, were Social Votech did have a mo has has modified their admissions policy. So in the past couple of years, they modified that so that the non-resident students were accepted up to a certain score. So they based off of their discipline records, their academic records, they're given a score, um, and then they're accepted based off of that score. Katie, too, about that, correct me if I'm wrong, but they're also, with the, with the modified policy, they could potentially accept non-resident students, for, such as Duxbury students, before they accept students from districts that are members, mm -hmm. right? So it used to be that they would Admit member town students, right, and then mm -hmm. kind of look at, but look at non-resident. But they've changed that, oh, so that's that's, that's 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 one of the reasons wow. that these numbers spiked. And they had explained to us too that so all of the member towns are allocated a certain number of 
seats okay. for their students. Okay. And previously, if one of the member towns didn't use their seats, it would it would be offered to some of the other member towns. And now, I don't believe that that's the case. I believe that that allocation does go to some of the non-member towns, right. depending on the on the student's score. And then, of course interest in diverse programs of study. So it's of the students that are going to the vocational um, schools, they're not all going into the same program. So when we, when the students submit their intent to apply, they submit it with a um, area of study that they would be um, interested in pursuing. So and I just listed some of the areas of study here, but there are a number of them across the board. And then also, um, one of I think one of the major impacts is a change in the South Shore Votech enrollment trends. So previously, um, the majority of the students were in-district students. So in 2016, they had 619 in-district and only 17 out of district. And then in 2018, that number dropped to 581. So with the, de the decrease in the in-district students, it's opening up that opportunity for some of the out-of-district towns to have more students attend their programs. Yeah. So how we're funding the gap. So one of the major ways that we fund the gap in any of the increase in expenses is due to the staff turnover that we see. So in fiscal year 20, we filled a total of 18 vacancies um, that we were able to reallocate the salaries. So we had 16 teachers and two administrators. And some of the new teachers um, in fiscal year 20 that we're reallocating some of the, the budget are long-term substitutes. So the reason that that's important is that we're able to reallocate that money for fiscal year 20 because they're covering for teachers that may be taking a, a leave or um, an extended a year-long leave, but then those teachers will come back into the budget for 21. So when we project or when we're looking at the fiscal year 21 operating budget, we always make sure that we're projecting on the, the teacher salary and not the, um, not the long-term substitute. Right. And then, so the savings in the professional salaries are used to cover our general expense deficit. So, um, and so the portion due to the long-term subs is 35%, so that's $61,000. Um, and that will not carry forward to fiscal year 21. And so the overall surplus that we have in fiscal year 20 is currently, um, for the professional salaries, is currently 183.060. So that will cover our increase in the um, out of district tuition and transportation costs. And then this is just a snapshot from, um, this is in one of the financial exhibits that we have in the budget. So it just shows our fiscal year 20 budget, what our revenue and grant offset is, um, and then what our original operating budget was, the recast amount, and then the difference. Just to kind of put an exclamation point on that, I mean, it's another, I mean, it's, it's good news, bad news, right? So we can reallocate and cover the, the deficit. Right. But we're effectively starting the FY21 budget process with a $180,000 deficit, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So you, you have to fill the gap in, in the budget process. So it, it's nice to have a short-term fix. It's incredible, um, incredibly lucky, actually. But um, it, it's a problem. It's a problem for FY20. We're, we're just in the hole before we start. So, well, it's fluid. You know, we'll, we'll work it work through with that. So, go ahead, Kate, sorry, intro. No, that's okay. Yeah. So, for, again, to reiterate. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. How's that for a segment? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, fiscal year 21 budget to 
reflect the increase in the general expense due to the tuition increase. So yes, we were able to cover the deficit for this year, but we have to realize that um, it will have a lasting impact into future budget cycles. And then it's, I think it's also important to note that, um, so it was $183,000 that was the deficit for this year, and it could be $180,000 going forward if we still have the same 17 kids, but we could get an additional. Yeah. So I think that's really important because, um, and at this point, going based off of a historical average is not going to help us because right. be, it's been so low. So it's just going to be very difficult to try to um, incorporate that into future budgets without having a huge increase. Um, and then also planning for the future, one of our options is to form a committee to research the possibility of joining Social Votech. So if that could potentially be um, an option for the district, for the town, mm. uh, to look that into that. Team? Well, so, so Katie and I have had uh, preliminary discussions with them. Um, it, it just, it's funny, the timing of it, where we were very interested in having a discussion after uh, mm. Julie and I met with um, Randy Reed and John Adams over the summer. We were about to set, um, call them up and Say start asking joined. questions. Yeah. And honestly, like it was almost within a day or two that they called us and said, you're interested in having a conversation. So we, Kitty and I went and met uh, over the summer with the superintendent. Uh, we're still trying to figure out, I'm not really certain of like their, their motivation for, for adding member towns yet. Um, we had some sense. Um, and for us though, and this is why we need to think about this very thoughtfully and with, with a representative committee is, we don't get much out of it financially, right? So it wouldn't necessarily be a huge cost savings for us because their tuition is still X, right? Um, we'd effectively save transportation costs because their per pupil cost is like an all in number, right? So if their tuition's 17,000, that would include all of their operating costs including. So there'd be, a, there'd be, a, there'd be some savings, for us, what we get though is is a is a seat at the table for, for governance, right? We would if we ever went forward with it, we get a seat at the table on the school committee. So the town of Duxbury would appoint a representative. There's a lot to be discussed, such as is, are there any upfront costs associated with yeah. joining? And I mm -hmm. I didn't mean to speak for a, an entire community, but I sort of told them that that was probably a non-starter for us, um, within within reason. I mean, it depends on what that number is. So we'll see. I, I, I would recommend that we at least continue to have dialogue because I think it would be great for, for our community long term. Uh, it's not necessarily going to help us in next year's budget, even, you know, long term, but I think it makes sense. Um, it surprised me that we aren't a member, and it's just a kind of random, random thing. But uh, I don't know what you guys think of that, but uh, we'll get more information at a minimum. But. Do, do any other, is there any way to? forecast like what student to gauge student interest earlier on to sort of like understand like whether they're leaning toward taking that direction do other schools do anything to and no I mean so we we get we start I mean I gotta think about the timing we kids start expressing interest as early as October uh, November October right? November, November. Yes. Yep. so so even last year we knew we knew that the the, the kids the number of kids interested was you know up mm -hmm. here but historically kids can't even they couldn't even get in Right? So I, ironically, like, it's hard to get into a vocational technical school in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. That's actually going on one of the biggest complaints by public school administrators, uh, re you know, re regular K-12 district administrators. It's hard to get kids in. So we didn't learn it until this summer that they had had this, this admissions change. So, that's, so in, in the past, if 18 kids, 18 kids applied, you know, a few might have gotten in. Now, all 18 got in. Mm -hmm. well, I'm, I'm making that number up as, but just about, right? So we so this year we'll have a better sense, but we'll have a sense and we'll have to we'll have to know that it's very likely that those kids will be admitted. But did more kids apply in addition to the rules changing? I mean, I, I, don't, I have to double I, I don't want to I don't want to say yes, I, I have to get more information. I don't, I don't right. know. 
I don't know the history yeah. on the applications. I'll, I'll find out. Yeah. yeah, it might be useful to hear from guidance what their experience has been over the years with mm -hmm. kids exploring that option yeah. and who who actually applied and then others who may not have applied thinking right. they wouldn't get, weren't going to get in. The other thing you mentioned to me the other day was that South Shore Vocational Technical School is, has its own expansion plans, um, which may include a new building. Oh, or so re renovation. 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 Mm -hmm. So there, we, we need to explore what the commitment is. With becoming a member's district, there's a commitment to support that type of expenditure as well as the operating expenditures. So. It's possible that we would get hit with an assessment even as a non-member district for their oh, really? project. Oh, okay. really? Yeah, so it's, again, we need to a research lot of stuff. stuff. I think yeah. it's, yeah. But it's well worth, it seems well worth exploring what, what all the implications are and then making an informed decision once we have all that information. And I, I think just think community-wide, there seems to be a more interest in alternative right. postgraduate. I mean, alternative um, you know, path, pathways. Um, so I, I do think it's something that's going to have to. And that's part of our strategic that's plan. We have, we're have we planning it's to have a committee this year to look at if we can have some vocational offerings within our program of studies and even have a track that would lead to some professional certifications within yeah, our yeah. current school and budget. Um, that's something we're exploring as well. Yeah. I'm just going to make a joke about opening that. Vocational technical school. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not a joke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Okay. Great. Right. Now, Mr. Farley. So, hmm? Tanner and Jess yeah. were the worst, okay? But we, you didn't get the memo that the meeting started at 6 tonight instead of 7, so we feel terrible. Um, I thought of that when they weren't here. Like, yeah. No, yeah. They must have so, no, so we, we I up. take full responsibility for that. <laughs> um, but why don't you guys, since, since you're here, and finish your homework that you can cool. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Awesome. So um, first thing I have on the list is that the Monday before school, uh, the s executive board student council put on the annual link day for the freshman orientation. And we did it a little differently this year. We kind of put a theme with link day and called it the Olympics. Um, so we had some games and it was a lot different than previous years because we saw an extra level of bonding between the leaders and the freshmen, which is pretty awesome. So Great. I think in the future, they'll probably do something like that. Uh, another thing I had on the list was, you guys probably already know this, but the um, class 2019, their gift to the class was a bridge mm -hmm. over the drainage ditch in the parking lot. So that was installed last week. And lastly, uh, for me, I have the open house is tomorrow for the high school and yeah, tomorrow at 6 p.m. So, so um, co-curriculars are starting back up and last year we did, instead of the club fair, we did like an activities video. So basically officers of each club got to record a little segment of why you should join their club and then it was broadcasted during iLab and we found it was pretty successful and more effective than like a club fair so we're going to do that again this year in hopes to get some more kids involved um, and then also guidance counselors last week were um, pretty preoccupied with getting schedules fixed but now they're back open for especially for seniors for getting like college um, the college process started, and I went and met with my guidance counselor. He's like, "We really would like to see more kids come in because you actually need to get a tran or yeah a transcript form." Um, so they're really encouraging um, seniors to come in and talk. And then lastly, um, for the seniors, our baby pictures, quotes, and like the "Where will you be in 20 years?" <laughs> is um, due this Friday, and you submit it to the yearbook club, and they do a really awesome job at putting it all together. So where will you be in 20 years? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Undecided. <laughs> I think that's about it for us. <laughs> how, uh, how do you like the Chromebooks? Adjustment. Yeah. 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 I mean, they're not as... Jess and I actually talked about this. We thought we were going to get the 
question. Um, they're not as bad as I thought they were going to be. <laughs> um, you were all over the max last year. Yeah. 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 Uh, one thing is just transitioning with them. Mm -hmm. Like it's taking us twice as long to do something we can do on our Mac, but over time we'll figure that out. Yeah, I think there comes like a lot of frustration at first when you're trying to do a five minute assignment, but then it takes 10 minutes because you don't know how to upload a picture. So it's kind of just working out those issues and learning the new system, which is just going to take time. But mm -hmm. I think kids right now are like, ooh, we really it would be nice to have those Macs, but it's just going to take time. So it comes down to, but yeah. they're nice otherwise. <laughs> Thank you, and we're sorry. I'm no, sorry. I'm just sorry. <laughs> six o'clock start time. Yeah, I know. Six o'clock right. from now on. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, would you like to talk about the blizzard? Bag? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, what we call um, blizzard bags is uh, notion of alternative um, school days, alternative structured learning days. Um, so last year, if you recall, we rolled out this this blizzard bag program, which allowed us to uh, assign uh, work to students on uh, days with inclement weather. And upon successful completion of those assignments, kids were marked in attendance. And so what that meant is that we didn't have to make up the day at the end of the year. I'll say this, for as many initiatives and ideas that we've implemented over you know, a 20 plus year career, that one actually worked well. Like it, it actually did, and there was, I, not I'm sure nothing's universal in public education, but I mean it's universally uh, well liked, you know, mm -hmm. by people. It just made sense in a lot of different ways, and what I would say is it worked for Duxbury, mm -hmm. right? And that's important to say. Okay, we had the resources, we had the structures in place um, to make it happen and, and make it happen well, right? So I I, I say that. Unfortunately, um, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education got involved. Um, and I had heard through the grapevine last spring that there were some rumblings that they were going to start reviewing it. And I sadly predicted what exactly happened, which is after reviewing it, they decided that they're no longer allowed um, for districts. And so they put an advisory out, which you have uh, this summer. And th there, there are points, um, and they, and I, I spoke with MASS um, yesterday, the Mass Association of School Superintendents, and um, just to get a sense of what their position was. Uh, for years, I sat on that executive committee, so I was kind of more on the know, but I wanted to get a, because I, I kind of know how things work behind the scenes there. And, and not surprisingly, they did push back on DESE and forced DESE to at least put a committee together to, to, to study it, and that committee's referenced um, in this advisory. But well, I think it was dead in the water before it, before it even started. And so the outcome of that committee, uh, even after all the input, was that it was no longer allowed. DESE's argument is that, um, and the argument from, I guess, some other interest groups too, is that um, ec equitable access for students was a major concern. And I'm, I'm with them on that. I am, right? But that's not our concern here in Duxbury, right? We talked that through. We made sure even how we rolled it out, that technology wasn't an issue, that t timing of having parental support at home wasn't an issue. We gave them two weeks to complete this assignment, right? We, we had those very difficult conversations over the course of a year as we planned it, but that was what they settled on. And so my issue is, and, and the Department of Ed is not surprised, I, I've been badgering them with this for, for almost 20 years, is they continue to um, make one-size-fits-all decisions. They continue to implement regulations that are one size fits all. Um, you know, it drives me crazy. Uh, and so, I don't mean to vent, I don't wanna make this a therapy session for me, but uh, it kind of, we are where we are right now, right? And so the program is effectively over, uh, at least for the time being. Um, I, I can't predict if, if that'll ever change. Um, but in the advisory, they said that if we have an approved plan in a community that we can we can continue um, to implement it for another year. I would strongly recommend, if, if there's interest, um, on the committee at least, that we, we try it for another year. Um, 
you know, and maybe maybe something changes, you know, with the regulation of policy um, that allows us to have it long term. But at, at least we wouldn't have kind of a break, and, and we can kind of continue to see, you know, continue to see how it works out for us. Um, so anyway, that, that's my recommendation. I've actually been talking to um, Josh Cutler about it, and uh, Josh has been having conversations out of his office with the Department of Ed just to get it, just to push back a little bit. And uh, I'm really. I'm really happy he's doing that. And, um, we anyway, have, we have Commissioner Riley visiting. Dr. I was just going to say, that. so we might want to just mention to him if we have an opportunity that yeah. we had a successful alternative learning program here in Duxbury, and we're disappointed to hear that mm. it's no longer going to be mm. a uh, town by town decision. Right. If mm. we have something that's working, so. Yes. Yeah. Nine forty on October yeah, 941. Yeah, we can yeah. tell him. <laughs> so anyway. I mean, again, I, I'm more frustrated that just that is just how the state has been operating for so long that they just make mm. they make blank they make one size fits all regulations, and it and it frustrates me in a Duxbury because we we are fortunate in this town, uh, and we know our community, we know our students, we know what our capacity is to get things right. done, and the individual needs of the community aren't taken into account many times. So, again, I've been beating that drum for years. I'm clearly not getting it. But uh, it, uh, <laughs> just another thing. So anyway, that it, so I, I don't know what you think. I would love to. I would love to have it in our toolbox this year. But yeah. long term, I don't. I don't think it's going to be a sustained. So. Well, I think there's a lot of community support for it. So I'd like to see it continue this year. Yeah. It's supposed to be a really bad winter. Yeah, the I know. Farmers' almanac. I know. Too. I know. <laughs> it might be a good year to have it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I know. So you need to hear it. Yeah. 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 So, so one week off in March. Oh, I know. That's it. Yeah, it's <laughs> I know that's unpopular. I know. Yeah. Well, you know, it's not. A, you know what the issue is? So, in the advisory from the Department of Education, they recommend uh, two things. One is, um, you know, recommending to districts that they start before Labor Day, which which we already do. Um, the second thing is. Recommending that instead of having a February and April vacation, that you have a consolidated one week in March, which I, I love that idea. The problem is, unless everybody does it, it's really not a viable option for students. Just consider staff alone, right? So we have over 400 employees. And so if, if we're taking off March mm -hmm. and every community around us in 20 square miles is taking off February and April, it really, really puts the burden on families. Yeah. And it, 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 that alone. Yeah. It makes it a tough option, um, and historically, people have looked at it in sports schedules and all those right. things. Um, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I would love that to happen. But yeah, you, you, you got you got to go all in or not, yeah. you know. So all right, so that, I mean that's the update. Great. It's Great. not it's not the end of the world or anything. I just yeah. thought it was such a really nice thing for the for us as a community, and uh, you know, easy come, easy go. Okay, uh, then we have two action items on the agenda. Uh, both are uh, approvals of overnight travel proposals. So we have the first one is for the middle school um, doing the, this current iteration of nature's classroom at Camp Cody in, in New Hampshire. And then the second one is the Holocaust Washington DC trip. Um, from Mrs. Sullivan. So, any conversations you want to have about either of those? I think they're both great trips. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I liked that um, Mrs. McGuire had put the cost per student on the proposal. Mm -hmm. So, I'd, I'd like to see that from okay. when. Mm -hmm. Whenever we get a memo asking for approval that we have a cost per student, they both do actually. Both, yeah, you got to go all the way down on the uh, high school one. Yeah. Oh, it is nice like, to have it up in front. Yeah. More than like subsequent pages. Like oh, I didn't get far enough. Table. Table. Oh, the, the table okay, the okay, that's yeah. being silly about. Yeah. Okay, great. It is. It is nice. That's a yeah. Yeah. Consistent. Right. <clears throat> okay. So. Um, May I have a um, motion to approve the uh, proposal for the trip to Camp Cody by Duxbury Middle School? So moved. Second. All in favor? 
Aye. Aye. And then may I have a motion to approve the proposal for overnight travel to Washington, D.C. for the Holocaust trip. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Okay. That's all done. Um, any other issues we want to raise? No, I, I think it was a great start to the school yeah. year. I have a middle schooler now. Yeah. Loving it. Good. Everything's wonderful. The new assistant principal is wonderful. You know, it's it's just nice. I mean, everybody does a good job. The web day leaders and the link leaders. We're doing it right. Good, good transition. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like this year was really smooth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but you know that that actually we were talking about this today. That is the consensus. It's been a really, really nice start. Yeah. Uh, I think we have the right people in place, and uh, so hopefully it stays that way. The uh, the only thing I wanted to bring up, and I don't know, last at the end of last year, you had talked about the wellness advisory council mm -hmm. needing a school committee member. So yes. I just wanted to raise that again to the committee and. Anybody would like to participate? What do we need? So we last year we met on Mondays at 3:30 here at Alden, mm -hmm. but we haven't established our schedule yet this year. So if there's a particular day that's great for you, I can throw that out there. But there's generally four to five meetings a year, so it's not every single month. Right. Interest? I could do Mondays. Okay. I don't know yet. I'll learn a few weeks. Okay. So okay. okay, that's what it is. Yeah, so when we right. set the dates, I'll share the would dates you? with the whole committee, and so if one of you yeah. Yeah. can pick that up, that would be great. It'd be great, great to have somebody on that. Are there any other committees you need a school committee person um, the on? The committees that we're running this year are a social and emotional learning committee to plan for our January PD day, which will be menu-based um, all social emotional learning activities. We'll, um, our district curriculum committee this year is focusing on writing, reading, and world language as the um, topics up for review. So we also right. talked about having some school committee presentations <coughs> by students from the different schools in right. those areas throughout the year. Yeah. Um, we will continue to have the um, internal dyslexia committee, which will have a meeting to right. report out some of the findings from that and recommendations. And the digital literacy um, committee will certainly need a, a school committee representative because we'll be working on that social media policy development. Okay. And other than that, I think that might be it for the year. Okay. Well, if you could keep us up to date and when you have Absolutely. meeting schedules. I'll share them with all of you. Share them and then yep. we can make sure we've got somebody. I mean, even we could do trade off mm -hmm. between two or three members just to make sure somebody's participating would be useful. <laughs> okay. Each year in the um, Right. Now, time for a public comment. Good. Okay. Well, um, in the absence of public comment, uh, may I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you. Right. <laughs> that guy, that was quick. <laughs> yeah, that was the new one? <laughs> She's good. She, uh,